the greatest revelation of the, the 60s dark underbelly that I've read. Better than food, man. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Sargent. Hope you're all doing well out there in the weird world. Good to see you as always. Clarity is the word that keeps coming to mind when I try to describe Didion's writing. A melancholy clarity that makes for an addictive read. Didion writes with the style of chic depression that doesn't come off as affected, but actually natural. Turning what could be and is a pessimistic mental obstacle for many into a stylistic literary signature. Joan has always had style. In part, she learned to write at Vogue in New York. Joan Didion, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure, is an American novelist and essayist from Sacramento, California. Slouching Towards Bethlehem is a collection of personal essays and social criticism, mostly taking place in California, published in 1968. According to a New Yorker article that I've linked to, she was a fifth generation Californian. Joan Didion's family traveled across the plains towards California with the Donner Party. They parted ways when the Donner Party decided to take the shortcut, the decision that led to why you know about them today. Joan's family, on the other hand, followed the map, and they were fine. And that's an interesting metaphor to think about, as we'll see, because a lot of Joan's concern in her, the titular essay, is about people who stray. I learned that from the documentary Joan Diddy in the Center Will Not Hold, which came out last year on Netflix and is terrific. I began watching it as I finished this collection and I started writing this review. And I highly recommend you do the same, though I urge you to read the book first and then watch the documentary. A fair warning though, it's absolutely devastating. And you'll hear more about that later in the review. Her writing influenced authors such as Brett Easton Ellis and Anthony Bourdain. Didion herself was influenced by Hemingway. In an interview with the Paris Review, who I steal from all the time, she said, uh, when I was 15 or 16, I would type out his stories to learn how the sentences worked. I taught myself to type at the same time. A few years ago, when I was teaching a course at Berkeley, I reread A Farewell to Arms and fell right back into those sentences. I mean, they're perfect sentences, very direct sentences, smooth rivers, clear water over granite, no sinkholes. That's interesting because not too long back, I reviewed Donald Ray Pollock's The Devil All the Time, and he, he described a similar situation when he was learning to write, which was copying people and, you know, typing out their sentences. I wonder if he did Hemingway. One of the great pleasures of reading so many books is that you begin to see the, the, the threads that tie so many writers together, you know, throughout, throughout the centuries. Sometimes it provides this nice sense of stability, or it's, or it's, it's just cool to, to see historically who was influenced by who, who was reading what, and uh, uh, I love that. I like having that artistic context. That's one of my favorite things to do, discovering the people who are influences on my favorite artists or writers. Growing up in Sacramento, California influenced much of her writing, and the vibe is a similar one to Eve Babbitt's particularly when writing about Los Angeles. I think they, they may have been writing in the same years. There's some crossover, definitely crossover in the people they knew. Naturally, they seemed to be running in the same circles around the same time. Babbitts was at one point seeing Jim Morrison, whom Didion did a piece on. Los Angeles at that time was beyond insane, it seems. Understatement, severe understatement. Actually, I'll just go ahead and correct myself. It looks like Babbitts came later uh, as far as publishing dates. The one I'm thinking about in particular, Slow Days Fast Company, was published in 1977. Highly recommended. San Francisco is the setting for the title essay, Slouching Towards Bethlehem. The greatest revelation of 60s darkness that I've read. The playwright David Hare says in the documentary, the idea that you could actually write the history of your time, which I think is what Joan has done, through the essay, and that this could be a form which would be as supple and as versatile and as nuanced as fiction, is something quite extraordinary. In her essays, Joan demonstrates her incredible ability to write stories about real life which read like fiction. She has an enviable ability to synthesize events into a poignant narrative, much of the time filled with painful self-examination and recollections of shifts in her life and perspective. And while it's dark, it never comes off as self-indulgent or moping. It just contains that melancholic flavor that often accompanies the exploration of memory, family, and the past. Writer and critic Hilton Owls, when talking about her other essay, a, a later essay, The White Album, uh, said in the film that you couldn't make a cohesive narrative about the times because the times weren't cohesive. So she found this way which was to kind of make a verbal record of the times. The center was not holding. 
It was a country of bankruptcy notices and public auction announcements and commonplace reports of casual killings and misplaced children and abandoned homes and vandals who misspelled even the four-letter words they scrawled. It was a country in which families routinely disappeared, trailing bad checks and repossession papers. Adolescents drifted from city to torn city, sloughing off both the past and the future as snakes shed their skins. Children who were never taught and would never now learn the games that had held the society together. People were missing. Children were missing. Parents were missing. Those left behind filed desultory missing persons reports, then moved on themselves. Yeah, that goes to Peterson, actually. Particularly the one that reminds me, um... Children who were never taught and would never now learn the games that had held the society together. That's from the title essay, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, where Didion explores the Haight-Ashbury district hippie counterculture in 1960s San Francisco. Lots of drugs. She writes in the preface, discussing the piece, that it was for me both the most imperative of these pieces to write and the only one that made me despondent after it was printed. It was the first time I had dealt directly and flatly with the evidence of atomization, the proof that things fall apart. I went to San Francisco because I had not been able to work in some months, had been paralyzed by the conviction that writing was an irrelevant act, that the world as I had understood it no longer existed. If I was to work again at all, it would be necessary for me to come to terms with disorder. The sinister reality she captures is one depicting a whole bunch of overgrown children who instead of surpassing the authoritarian figures that they claim to be fighting against with peace, love, and acid, seem instead to be devolving into a slovenly burnt out culture of addiction and negligence. After we read about these people she's hanging around who are constantly on some sort of substance, we come to the ending scene where she comes face to face with this five-year-old child whose mother has been giving her acid and peyote for a year. And words can't describe the horror, you know, just, just how disturbing that is. You begin to see the devastating effects and this, this extremely grim future uh, in the moral structural collapse of this generation, which is going to be directly inherited by the next. And it's very interesting to see how everything has led to what it has. Didion's essay is one of the greatest warnings, you know, much more so than don't do drugs. It's like this is what happens when you have a whole bunch of abandoned children who suddenly themselves could have children. Slouching Towards Bethlehem is a reference to the poem The Second Coming by W.B. Yeats. I finished this collection, this was the first Didion I'd ever read, and I'm already excited to reread these essays. There's no time to go into all of them here, but some of my additional favorites were On Self-Respect, that contains the magnificent line, However long we postpone it, we eventually lie down alone in that notoriously uncomfortable bed, the one we make ourselves. Whether or not we sleep in it depends, of course, on whether or not we respect ourselves. And the other was the final essay, Goodbye to All That, which is about her falling in love with and then leaving New York, and contains this chilling line which now haunts me. That was the year, my 28th, when I was discovering that not all of the promises would be kept, that some things are in fact irrevocable, and that it had counted after all. Every evasion and every procrastination Every mistake, every word, all of it. I'm 28. I definitely feel that way. <laughs> In the same essay, she also describes New York as such. It is often said that New York is a city for only the very rich and the very poor. It is less often said that New York is also, at least for those of us who came there from somewhere else, a city for only the very young. Joan Didion went on to write many more books, and she's still alive at 83, and you can see in the documentary, you know, she's still got it. Her husband, John Gregory Dunn, who was also a writer, died, and shortly after that, Quintana, who was John and Joan's daughter, died as well. So Joan got hit with this unbelievable tragedy within the space of two years. There's this moment in the documentary where she and Vanessa Redgrave are reminiscing while looking over a photo album. You see, Vanessa Redgrave also lost her daughter. I think it may be one of the most emotionally devastating things I've ever seen. It's very touching and beautiful, but at the same time, when you know how much pain they've been through, it's just heartbreaking. Didion's stoic control over her own emotions, what she reveals in her ability to distance herself from events in order to write about them, is remarkable, given the pain that she's endured. 
While being interviewed by Susan Brody, she said, I'm only myself in front of my typewriter. Better than food. I can't wait to read the rest of her work. If you're a fan of Hunter S. Thompson, Susan Sontag, again, Eve Babbitts, if you're interested in Hollywood Babylon by Kenneth Anger, or The Day of the Locust by Nathaniel West, you know, the theme of darkness under the Californian sun, then this is essential reading. Now, who's gonna get it for the coffee lottery? The coffee lottery, for those of you who are new, is where I draw a name from this mason jar, and they are sent a hard copy of the book and a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And if you are interested in getting in on the lottery, having your name placed in the mason jar, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. And I sincerely appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who has already donated. Good luck to you all. Let's see who's going to get slouching towards Bethlehem by Joan Didion and a bag of that delicious Ethiopian coffee that I've been drinking and loving. Oh, Kate. Wonderful. Kate. Kate, Kate is a long time supporter of the show and I've wanted to draw her name for a while now and I'm so happy I did. Kate, awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for supporting the show and terrific, awesome. All right. Kate is going to get Slouching Towards Bethlehem by Joan Didion and a bag of delicious coffee. Please subscribe if you have not already so I can tell you about more great books and then subsequently you can go and tell people about these great books and. We can all have our lives changed for the better across the country, internationally. That's actually happening. That's why I love this project. It's, it's, I love it. I, I, I absolutely love doing this. And uh, I, I, all of you who have been recommending books and, and, and chatting with me and, and telling me stories, I just, I'm so thankful for you. I, I really am. And uh, thank you. Thank you for watching. It's great to see you as usual. Always remember life is far too short to read bullshit. Take care of yourselves, stay safe out there in this weird, wild world. And if you'd like to find me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, you may do so easily. And a like on Facebook would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.